I'm your host, Aaron Heath. I'd like to take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 54 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash zero pi four. Well, we're here on episode 54 with a savage Model 10 Predator Hunter in 22250 as our gun of the show. Now, this is a rifle I bought after a group of prairie dogs figured out, hey, every time we see those bumps out there at about 150 yards out, we start dying. Now, as a package, this particular rifle has confirmed rodent kills out to 450 yards. We would have shot them further out than that, except the greatest distance we had available on that particular field, well, was about 450 yards. It was a little bit further than that, but I don't recall exactly how far it was. It got to the point that the prairie dogs wisened up, and they they actually at one point had figured out if a vehicle approached from the direction that we came from and stopped at the field, it was time to go underground or they were going to start dying. The landowner, for a while, he thought there were no prairie dogs. Until one day he did his uh, little route backwards and he stopped coming from the other direction. Prairie dogs popped up and he realized they'd just wisened up a little further than uh, anybody had thought. Now this particular rifle was the one that I used. My buddy that I was hunting prairie dogs with on this field, he had a very similar setup from Stevens, which is a subsidy of Savage. But this rifle, like many in my collection, is no longer in production in quite the configuration that I have it in. Now the Savage Model 10 that I have is a combo package, and it came with a matching scope, rings, bases, to go along with the rifle and stock that was all done in a mossy oak camo dip. All the components match as a result, so everything looks good. The Everything matches up. Overall, it's a very attractive package. Now it's chambered in 22250 and it's equipped with a Simmons scope that has proven itself reliable and accurate when it comes to dispatching prairie dogs at over 400 yards. Now, as a package, this entire combination was very affordable and capable from the dealer I got it from. Some very quick specs on it. It is the Model 10 Predator Hunter package. It's chambered in 22250, has a capacity of four rounds in the magazine. It is a bolt action. It does not have any sights, although it did come with an included optic. The material is steel. It's got a synthetic stock. And this particular rifle, I believe, was made before Savage started producing this Accu stock in large quantity. It weighs around 9 pounds. And as far as MSRP goes, it's no longer in production. Although there is a similar Model 11 slash 111 package with comparable, although in my opinion, lesser features. That particular package in the Model 11 retails for around $713 if you go by MSRP. Street prices will be a little lower than that. And if you're listening to this podcast two or three years from now, the MSRP will definitely be off, I almost guarantee. But if you listen to this podcast regularly, you know my disclaimer about uh, MSRP is more of a negotiating point for dealers because the manufacturers intentionally inflate it and MSRP can change between the time this podcast is released, which is April 10th of 2015, and whatever day that you're listening, or it's actually not released, but when it's recorded on April 10th of 2015, and whatever day that you're listening to it, possibly years down the road. Now, with that said, I think I'm going to wrap up the Gun of the Show segment, hit the audio that tells you how to get the show, and then we'll be back with listener feedback. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Now we do have a bit of listener feedback that I want to touch on, but first off, I want to touch on something that was emailed to me by Douglas. He gave this big old long spiel about not trying to track where he emailed it from because he was faking his Mac address and he was using a Starbucks, I think it was a Starbucks, open access point and he was basically doing it incognito, kind of like a a true patriot would. However, Douglas wrote in stating he is an active member of Open Carry Texas and is demanding I provide listener stats and compare them to 
some rather long-established radio programs, and one of these programs would eventually turn into a podcast when they were dropped by their radio station, which, in my opinion, was a bad idea on the radio station's part. Now, the shows he wants me to compare my listener numbers to are Tom Gresham's Gun Talk Radio, which has been on the air for over 20 years and is, uh, you know, it's on several major market radio stations. And the second program he wanted me to compare it to is Guns Over Texas Radio, which became a pure podcast after their uh, major market, which would be Houston, radio station canceled them. Now, when they were canceled, uh, they had already been releasing their radio program as a podcast, but when they got canceled, they continued the show as a podcast-only format. And that's great, because that program was, I'll be honest, it needed to continue. Now, he also names off a few other pro-gun podcasts and a couple other radio programs, some of which I'd never even heard of, but he wants me to compare my numbers to these that are obviously going to be a much higher comparison. But let's consider that when you start a podcast, you try to niche it down to a point where you can concentrate on a very specific audience and not spread your topics all over the place. This particular podcast is focused on gun rights in the state of Texas, thus the name. And in the legislative session, as well as the run-up to the legislative session, the focus of this podcast has been and will continue to be elections, pre-file bills, legislation that's being handled by the legislature, committee hearings, and things like that. Now, the rest of the time, when we're not dealing with legislative stuff, this podcast is going to be focused more on training and general information, disseminating general information. To do what Douglas asked, I would actually have to go and see what my numbers are, which I don't. I don't care about my listener numbers. And then I would have to find some manner of determining what the other program's numbers are, and then publishing that information, which the other programs would probably consider confidential, just wouldn't be right. Now, you consider that I don't promote my podcast much at all, especially like the radio programs are promoted, nor do I have one or more major market radio stations broadcasting my audio. So, let's compare my podcast to something that's a little more situated in its ballpark. Like, I don't know, OCT Radio. OCT Radio is a podcast that was started by Open Carry Texas. And as far as I know, I think they've been active about six months. Or they started the podcast about six months ago. And they have a total of six episodes, but they were trying to do it on a weekly basis. In fact... I want to say the last episode of OCT Radio was released uh, late November, early December. I'll look it up and put it in the show notes. But as I'm recording this, I'm recording this episode on April 10th of 2015. And where they have six episodes, I have 54. And my show predates theirs, and it's continuing after. So, in all honesty, I don't know what to tell you if you're wanting to compare this podcast to any others because I still don't have any information on OCT Radio's numbers. All I can do is give you what they've done. Now, Douglas, I hope that kind of situates what you're wanting to know, because we both know that when you wrote this in, you were doing it to try and, well, it was done as an attack, and I really don't care. You can attack me. In fact, Douglas, uh, how about this? Why don't you get the numbers for your podcast and I'll find the ones for mine. I know my media host will provide them. In fact, I think there's a report section that I can look at and tell me this. Oh, but wait a minute. I don't know of any podcast relating to firearms hosted by somebody by the name of Douglas that uses Wi-Fi in a Starbucks with a fake Mac address. And for you computer people that understand what that is, uh, I appreciate it. And for those of you who don't know, let's just say that He's doing things to try and make it extremely difficult to track who he is, even though, well, I have no point in trying to track him. I don't see any point in trying to track him. It's just paranoia. However, moving on, Sarah Jones wants to know if I w will ever have a Texas manufactured firearm, preferably an STI, as the gun of the show. Well, Sarah, I would love to get my hands on an STI and shoot it and do a quick overview of it and make it the gun of the show. But, well, I don't have access to one right now, so I won't be doing an STI unless a listener wants me to do theirs. And if a listener wants me to do that, well, they can send me an email. And towards the end of the show, we'll have the contact audio play where they can hear how to do that. 
but I do have uh, access to a few firearms made in Texas. I may or may not review them. It depends on the owner's uh, position. And I may even have one or two in my own collection. We don't know yet. We'll see. It just wouldn't do to talk about what future guns of the show would be, now would it? Now with that said, I want to go ahead, I want to run the audio clip that tells you how to get the show, and then we'll be right back and move right on into our topic. Oops, I hit the wrong button. Sorry about that, but don't worry, I'll leave that in, because, well, I want you to see what the podcast is all about. I want you all to hear when I make a mistake. I don't hide my mistakes, I don't edit them out, and I do own up to them, just like that one. Now here's the audio clip that tells you how to find us on social media, which is the one I should have ran. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook, you can follow it on Twitter, you can circle it on Google+, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. Now this episode, we're dealing with a what's essentially a legislative update on gun rights and gun control that's been going on in the House of Representatives. To kick things off, House Bill 2405 is an attempt by Representative Poncho Navarez to scuttle the protection we enjoy with Texas Penal Code 30.6. Poncho Navarez talks about a friend that he has who likes to test and, well, he likes to test businesses that post invalid signs, and he says he doesn't understand why people would want to do so. And maybe, this is just me speaking here, but maybe Representative Navarez needs to evaluate who his friends are a little better. Because this is not something I will do. But let's go on. Let's look at let's look at what his bill does. Basically, it takes the written notification and the signage requirement and it does away with the written notification. And the only way to notify is verbally or by signage. It goes on to require the director of the DPS to adopt the rules for signage. There are no limits on when the DPS could change the signage rules or how small they could make the minimum sign be. Now, the required language would be Section 30.6, Penal Code. It doesn't say anything about uh, concealed carry, open carry, or whatever. It would also require that the DPS make a printable sign available on its website, and it would also limit the size of the sign to 8.5 by 11 inches. Signage would have to meet very specific coloration for the logo, but not the rest of the sign, and it would require that the sign be placed at each entrance in a conspicuous manner. I don't know about you, but when, when you're trying to serve notice to somebody, you really don't try to limit how, how big that notice can be. And as a result, I have a serious problem with an upper limit on the size of the signage. To me, that's a sign that this bill was written to trap CHL holders. Now, Terry Holcomb did testify, as well as Alice Tripp, but Alice's testimony was pretty much, we don't like this bill, and we're, we are opposed to it. And I agree with her 100%. Terry Holcomb, he, he represents Texas Carry. He's been on this podcast in the past when it was the Open Carry Report. And he pointed out that MDA has lied multiple times in their testimony, which is true. Now, he also stated that Texas Carry would support the bill if the penalty, which is a Class A misdemeanor, was removed. Well, let's consider that gun rights are civil rights, and the civil rights movement has had to deal with signage since it began. At one time, it was signs that said, No Negroes. And then those signs became Negro restroom or Negro water fountain or this or that under the separate but equal ruling. And now, supposedly, we need to change the laws so that it would be easier to post signage banning the legal license carry of firearms that no one sees and no one's bothered by. Why? For 18 years, there have been no problems with the current signage. And it's important to note that unenforceable signage would not have been, or unenforceable signage that would not have been compliant under this bill or current law has been used to arrest people who have been carrying legally. One such case is documented on the Texas CHL form, and I will provide a link in the show notes to that incident. But in reality, you have multiple classes of property. And in this case, let's consider three classes. First off, there's private property. Then there's public property and commercial property, with commercial property being a hybrid between public and private in that it's privately owned, but it's publicly accessible. All property is is subject to some form of regulation in some capacity. 
zoning laws are a good example of regulation on property rights. Building codes are an example of, pro- of, uh, of regulation on property rights. You can't build a house and run bare wiring through the structure and hope that it doesn't catch on fire because building codes will prohibit that. You cannot run 50,000 outlets off of one strand of wire because of building codes. But the most regulated form of property is public property because it's under government control. Everything about that property is regulated. And then you have what we're going to refer to as private property, which most people consider to be unregulated, even though it's minimally regulated. And when I refer to private property in this ep- in this uh, in this argument, this private property is privately owned property that is not publicly accessible. This would be like your home or your fenced-in yard or your farm or your ranch, where when somebody shows up, there's a very set area that they can access until you give them permission to access more. Now, when we get to commercial property, commercial property is different. And a lot of people consider it to be the most regulated, but it's not. Commercial property, like I said, is a hybrid of pub- public and private property, and it's subject to regulations that are not imposed upon regular private property. You see, a commercial owner, property owner cannot bar customers based on race. They have to ensure that their buildings and parking lots have sufficient access for the disabled customers. They cannot force employees or customers to vote for one candidate over another or attend one church instead of whatever other church is available and so on. Texas Penal Code Section 30-6 is a minor regulation that prevents property owners from hiding signage that could result in someone losing many of their rights along with their freedom. A concealed handgun license holder is expected to know and comply with the laws. That's a given. A driver's license holder is expected to know and comply with the laws that apply to them as well. That's also a given. The same applies to a school teacher, TABC licensee, a T-close licensee, which would be a law enforcement officer, business owner, and so on. Business owners, small and large, have always benefited from clearly written and very specific laws like Texas Penal Code Section 30-6. Large signage requirements are neither rare nor are they unique, but they are in the best interest of the public, especially when the requirements for such signage are clearly written and they're not subject to fiat by a government agency or some appointed official that answers just to another official. And House Bill 2405 would make the 30-06 signage subject to fiat by the director of the DPS. Now, Representative Navarez indicated that he felt a Class A misdemeanor was excessive for the violation of this bill. He did not say he was going to amend the bill to correct it, but he did indicate he, you know, he was open to considering it being done. Now, he didn't indicate that he would strike the penalty altogether, like Terry Holcomb suggested, but there was a kind of a feeling in the committee hearing that, yeah, that would probably happen. My position is that if the penalty is removed, we really need to consider why it's being done. This bill was introduced under the auspice that current 30-06 signs are difficult for property owners to post in compliance with the law and that CHL holders tend to ignore non-compliant signage. If the penalty is removed, then two years down the road, we're going to see new legislation being proposed under the guise that CHL holders are ignoring the law and carrying past signs that have no penalty. Additional issues that we are likely to see this legislation address in either current amendments or through future legislation are long gun carry and open carry should it pass. Essentially, this bill is incomplete and it's going to attack 30-06. If open carry passes and you have your new 30-07 sign, then you have to you have a big sign again to ban open carry. And why are you going to do it? I really don't see I don't see this bill passing and not causing additional problems. And if the bill does pass, I guarantee you we're going to see in the next legislative session We're going to see an effort to try and increase the penalty if it's reduced or if it's eliminated. We're going to see it added back, and I guarantee you, when they start tinkering with the penalty in the next legislative session, there's going to be a push to make it a felony because CHL holders know the intent of the property owner, and they need to be punished for ignoring that property owner's intent. And that's, that's just like 
burglarizing a structure. While we may not see it that way, that's what the anti-gun hysterics will be like. And that's what we're going to end up having to fight. Well, let's move on to House Bill 910 and go with some better news. House Bill 910 is the House version of the open carry bill. Now, it's been moved out of the calendars committee and is, ex- and is scheduled for a hearing on April 14th. This will be its second reading. Now, when you get to the second reading, you're a lot closer to getting the bill out of the House. If things can hurry up, we might be able to get SB 17 substituted for House Bill 910. And then it'll short-circuit the whole process. It can move through the House and get sent to the governor. But I don't see that happening. I see this bill going to the Senate and Senate Bill 17 eventually making its way through the House and one of the two bills finding its way to the governor's desk for signage or to be signed. In my opinion, we need to get open carry passed. We need to get campus carry passed. And then we need to come back, start making plans for next session while we work on getting our smaller bills through the House. And there are smaller bills that we want to get through the House. We want to get them through the Senate, and we want to get them signed by the governor. But we want to see open carry and campus carry move through the legislature, signed, and we want to get the smaller bills moved through and signed. And I'll be honest, I'm already working on my wish list for the 2017 session. That's kind of a scary thought for me that I'm already thinking, we need to start worrying about 2017. I know our our opposition is. They're looking at legislation that they've got filed. They're saying, okay, if this passes, we need to be in a position to do this in the next session to move it forward. While we're thinking, if this passes, we need to be in a position to do this against it in the next session. And then the roles are also reversed with our legislation. We're thinking, okay, in the next session, we got to be ready to do this if our legislation this session passes. And our opponents are planning their attacks on on our current legislation for the next session. Everybody's playing chess. And unfortunately, I don't like chess. But still, if I've got to play chess, then I'll play chess. And with that said, let me run the audio clip that tells you how to get in touch with me. We'll come back, we'll do the news segment, and then I'll sign the show off and we'll get out of here. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. Now we've got four news stories instead of our usual three for this episode. Now three of these are going to be political, with one of them being uh, a a story about House Bill 2405. But there's a reason I brought that story in, even though I covered everything that's in that article. Our first story in the politics category, scare tactics are not stopping the progress of pro-gun bills in the legislature, so the media decides to break out the race card with an article that is headlined with, GOP gun measures could backfire with minorities, which was run by the Texas Tribune. The article claims that roughly half of all Hispanics and blacks support stricter gun control laws, while it ignores the fact that recent that a very recent Pew uh, poll shows that more minority voters view firearms as a means of protection from crime. Now, with tactics like this, we'll next hear from the media that a white hood will be required for the use of, uh, or for anybody wanting to open carry. Sorry about bumping the microphone. But if that's the, you know, it's scare tactics like that that we see from the media. And it's not a stretch of the imagination to see them saying, well, oh, You'll have to be a member of the Ku Klux Klan to open carry, or if you open carry, it'll be like you're a Klan member. And they will make that claim. Just wait. Our next story is about two gun control groups, Every Town for Gun Safety Action Fund and the Texas chapter of Moms Demand Action. Wait a minute. Isn't that like two chapters of Bloomberg's uh, money pit? But anyways, they're going, they're going to be running anti-campus carry advertisements in a number of Texas television markets. Well, consider this. This ad campaign is going to be a demonstration of how much money Michael Bloomberg is willing to throw at Texas to get his way in Texas. It kind of reminds me of those old Pace Picani commercial sauce, or Pace Picani sauce commercials. And the way those commercials go, if you don't remember, go look them up on YouTube. But somebody would say, it's made in New York City. And, and one of the others would say, New York City, get the rope. <laughs> 
they were going to lynch the guy that brought uh, piccani sauce made in New York City. Well, I'm not saying we need to lynch Bloomberg, but we need to run him out. We need to get him and his little groups out of Texas because, you see, it was people from out of state that came in that kind of got House Bill 115 through, uh, you know, in 1871. We can't have that. That's just, they're just here to further propagate their past crimes. That's all there, that's all there is to it. Now, the third story I want to touch on in the, poli- in the politics category is the attack on Section 30-06 being in full swing. But when the gun banners started saying it, and they actually mentioned this in the uh, House testimony, the uh, House committee testimony, they said that, well, the sign was as big as a five-year-old. And you may be thinking, that's a pretty good-sized sign. But in this article, they claim it's as big as a pony. Now, for the poll, next week I'm going to say that they'll be claiming the sign is as big as a bridge. Give it a week or two, it'll be as big as a skyscraper. Followed by, Following that, it'll be as big as a small island. Every time they go to the media, the sign gets bigger and bigger and bigger in their descriptions. Let's face it, if the sign is as big as a pony, even a Shetland pony, that's at least four foot wide. You cannot convince me that a sign is that big. It's going to be required by law because it's not true. Depending on your five-year-old, the sign could be as big as a five-year-old. But if your five-year-old is, say, exceptionally tall, it won't be. In fact, I don't think an average height five-year-old is really a fair comparison for the sign. I think it's actually a short five-year-old that's needed to compare the sign to. But then we got one more story in the miscellaneous category, which I bring up because people tend to believe what they hear and see on the news. And the news media tends to lead people into doing things that, well, are not in their best interest. You see, two California men were arrested in Abilene for unlawfully carrying weapons in a Whataburger restaurant. Remind me, I got something to tell you about Whataburger. But the arrest came about because the men thought Texas was already an open carry state. Where did they get this idea? It had to be the media or it had to be television. And this is a good example of why you need to research your information for yourself than relying on what others tell you. You see, the media tends to intentionally mislead people. This may be so that they commit crimes that they believe are actually not crimes, or it may be to cause fear and make people want to get laws changed so that whatever agenda is being pushed by the media is served. Think about it. You see the media, they're always talking about stand your ground as a license to kill, and Castle Doctrine allows people to kill their daughter's boyfriends when they bring their daughter home a little bit late. And none of that's true. Castle Doctrine, Stand Your Ground. These were laws designed to protect people from criminals or allow people to protect themselves from criminals. There is no, there's no way that the law is what the media tells people it is. And yet people go along, they believe that, and then they do something, they get arrested. It's like the guy that tried to use the Joe Biden defense when he fired a warning shot from a shotgun. Well, he might have fired through the door. But Joe Biden made the statement because it served his agenda. His agenda was to try and get people to move away from more effective means of self-defense. And, well, this guy did it and tried to use that as a defense in court, and it didn't work. These guys probably heard that Texas was Texas had passed open carry instead of the Texas Senate passed open carry. And these guys probably thought, oh, it's perfectly legal. Or maybe they saw videos of Open Carry Texas or Come and Take It, the political group, walking around with their black powder pistols. But whatever it was, these people were walking around. They had the guns in open sight. They were openly carrying their handguns. They got arrested for it. Ignorance of the law is no excuse, that sort of thing. But the media, Hollywood, and general misinformation has all contributed to this. If these men had thought about it and done their own research, they would have been a lot better off. And with that said, I want to say thank you to the listeners who have emailed in with feedback. I want to say thank you to Douglas. His email will entertain me, even though that was not his intention. I also want to thank you to say thank you to everybody that has contacted their representatives and their senators and even other folks in politics and let them know what your position is. I also want to thank those who will continue to do so or who will do so in the future. And I want to thank everybody that's listening to the podcast. With that said, stay safe and please carry responsibly.
Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly. Let me just say that now that we're in the after show portion of the episode, I have been kind of busy with electronics lately. I kind of got something else going on. And, well, this episode is one that I threw together today. So I want to thank everybody for, well, the new segments. All four of those came from listeners. I want to thank listeners for sending me those. I think each of these came through my Google feeds, but I'm not 100% sure. Because when somebody writes everything for me. I want to do it. I want to put it in there just like they did it as a way to say thank you to them. So let me go ahead and say on the first news story that was sent in by a gentleman named Adam. The second one sent in by a gentleman named Jason. The third one was sent in by a Zian, Z-I-A-N, and the last name is Contreras. Zian Contreras, I guess. I don't know if that's a guy or a girl, but thank you, Zian. If I, and I'm certain I'm mispronouncing your name, and I apologize for that. And our fourth news story, the one about the two California men, was sent in by our own Miranda Lawson, who emails us on a regular basis. And Miranda, sometime we're going to have to, sometime when you're in the area, let me know. We'll have to meet in person. I know we met once briefly, but I think we need to meet and have a talk. You keep emailing about the podcast, and I want to say that I think you might be interested in doing your own. You spend a lot of time on the road. You're listening to a lot of podcasts. Why not do your own? Your vehicle may be a little bit noisy to do it in, but that just, that'll just that just add character. Think about it, Miranda. And for those of you who don't know, Miranda's here in West Texas like I am. And I don't mean the city of West that was blown away by a fertilizer plant. I mean West as in on the New Mexico state line. But anyways, that's a wrap for this episode. And please stay safe and carry responsibly.